All right, welcome back. We are in chapter 10. We're going to be covering job attitudes. And in this section, we're going to break up the antecedents of job attitudes and the consequences of job attitudes. So let's dive in. First off, what are attitudes? We all probably use that word. We know what it means sort of conceptually. But the definition of an attitude is the degree of positive or negative feeling a person has toward a particular place, person, or thing. So it could be a positive attitude. It could be a negative attitude, right? And attitudes are feelings. Um, sometimes they can be emotional feelings. Sometimes they can be mental feelings towards a, a particular person, place, or thing. So why are job attitudes important? I'll bet you guys already have a pretty good guess why job attitudes are important. And I'll bet um, most of you have had um, job experiences, work experiences. They could be volunteer experiences. They could be um, your times that your parents asked you to do chores around the house where sometimes your um, job attitude was more positive about that person, place, or thing. Um, and or your attitudes were more negative. So you probably already have a really good grasp of what we're talking about and why these attitudes might be important. Um, because for one thing, they really influence work behavior, right? If you have a more positive attitude towards what you're doing, you tend to work harder, longer, um, your esprit de corps, you know, your attitude can really affect everybody else around you. Um, so they influence work behavior. Um, and then as researchers in this area, one of the things that is important about job attitudes is that they can really help us researchers to understand the complexities of work life and then non-work life, right? Because in job attitudes, we start to see the bringing together of um, non-work influences on work life. So let's dive in. All right. The theory of planned behavior says that we have intentions and that leads us to behave in certain ways. Um, but one of the things, if, if you follow this notion that your intentions are what lead to behavior, there's got to be that next question, which is, well, what causes your intentions? Like, why would you have a particular intention toward executing a particular behavior? Like, what, what starts it? Well, one thing that affects your intentions would be your attitude. Um, another thing that would affect your intentions would be what is known as a subjective norm. Um, what that means is your perception that there are social pressures to want to do certain things or to not want to do certain things. And those are going to impact your willingness to do certain things. Um, so subjective norms are your, the word subjective means it's your interpretation of the norms around you, the social pressures around you. Um, and then there's the perceived behavioral control, and that's your belief about your ability to perform the behaviors that were, would ultimately um, result from your intentions. Interestingly, the research on perceived be um, behavioral control shows that it doesn't have much of an effect on a person's intentions. So um, feeling like you are or aren't competent to complete the behavior doesn't really have as big of an impact on your intentions to do the behavior. And in fact, doesn't have much of an impact on you actually executing the behavior. A lot of people who think they can't accomplish a task will actually undertake the task and, and they're able to perform it or not, but they're, they're doing the behavior, even though their perception is that they don't have the behavioral control it would take to execute it. And then the inverse is true. Also, there are people who feel like they could do a particular behavior. Um, they feel like they've got what it takes to be able to perform it, and yet they never do it. So um, it turns out that that is not, the per perceived behavioral control doesn't seem to influence intentions or ultimate behavior. So what we're really going to focus in on in this discussion is going to be how attitudes influence our intentions and how our perception of the subjective social norms is going to affect our intentions. So this is going to go beyond the expectancy theory that we've talked about before. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more detailed than what we've talked about before. All right. So in this first section, this first lecture I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be talking about job satisfaction and then we'll move on to other topics in other lectures. So job satisfaction, according to Locke's definition, it would be the pleasurable, positive emotional state resulting from the cognitive appraisal of one's job or job experiences. So 
it's really important to notice that it's the cognitive appraisal, right, that creates the pleasurable positive emotional state. It doesn't have to be that your job is actually pleasurable, right? You might actually do some unpleasant things as part of your job, but as long as your cognitive appraisal reflects positively on what you do for a living, um, it's you're going to have um, job satisfaction as opposed to a person who maybe they have a job that is very pleasurable or neutral, but their cognitive appraisal is negative, they're not going to experience the job satisfaction. So here's what we're really going to focus on throughout this discussion. The antecedents, those are the things that come first. So what things lead to job satisfaction would be the antecedents. We're going to talk about how we measure job satisfaction and then the different dimensions of job satisfaction. And then we're going to ultimately talk about the consequences of job satisfaction. So let's start with those antecedents that can lead to job satisfaction. First off, there are characteristics of the job. And there are a lot of things that have been studied. In the skill variety, a lot of people think, well, you would be more satisfied with a job that has lots of different things that you get to do each day. Other people, um, so some people might look at that as like, I get to do lots of different things per day. Other people might look at it as like, I have to do all these different things. <laughs> like I never get to really focus on one task. Um, so skill variety is one of the things that's been examined. Um, task identity, task significance, um, autonomy. You know, some people are going to find that to be a, a benefit. Some people are going to find it to be a detriment in a job. Um, job feedback, how much you find out how well you did, you know, like how much feedback comes back to you. And then workload. So there are certain characteristics of a job that have been um, studied and have been shown to contribute to job satisfaction. So on all of these slides where I'm talking about the, this framework, all correlations are going to be between whatever the factor is and then ultimate job satisfaction measures. And so you'll notice I only have two labeled here, task identity and autonomy, um, because they, either, the other job characteristics have been discussed and not studied, or there's been really highly mixed results. So I didn't, I didn't list them here. Um, so task identity and autonomy seem to be positively correlated with job satisfaction. Um, so those seem to be characteristics of the job that at least as far as our research has shown um, can contribute to job satisfaction. So if a person really identifies with the task that they're performing, you see that 0.31 correlation coefficient, it's, you know, that's considered a, a moderate um, degree of correlation. So they go together. The 0.46 is a stronger correlation. Um, so autonomy seems to be a better predictor of job satisfaction than task identity does. Individual personal characteristics. Now, of course, uh, no job has control over which characteristics a person actually has, but they can, you know, maybe try and sort through applicants and seek out um, employees that have certain characteristics, right? Because affective disposition, that would be emotional disposition. Whenever we see the word affective, it means emotions. Um, might refer to like moodiness. Um, certain genetic qualities may have an impact on job satisfaction, and then self-esteem may have an impact. Um, the only correlation that I can provide to you is on the self-esteem measure, and you'll see that 0.58 indicates that that's pretty well correlated with um, job satisfaction. So how good or bad a person feels about themselves has an, imp um, an impact on job satisfaction. So that being a positive correlation, that means that people with higher self-esteem tend to have higher job satisfaction. Now, it's really super important to remember that correlations do not establish causation. So we can't say that a person with higher self-esteem will have higher job satisfaction. It's possible that um, self-esteem is causing job satisfaction. It's possible that job satisfaction is causing self-esteem. So that directionality problem is always going to be looming. And the other thing we need to worry about is that there might be some third variable. So there may be something that's not being identified in this correlation that's causing both the self-esteem and the job satisfaction. And those two are just correlating with each other because they happen to be occurring together but neither is causing the other. So we have to keep in mind that I'm just reporting correlations. We don't know that, um, just to go back to job characteristics, that you know people who experience higher levels of autonomy um, having higher job satisfaction, we can't say that, well, if I, if I give a person autonomy in their job, they're going to be more satisfied with the job. We can't say something like that. No matter how strongly correlated they are, we can't say that. Um, social factors have been defined as possibly impacting job satisfaction. So relationships that the person might have within the organization, um, relationships that they might be having outside the, the um, organization might also contribute to job satisfaction. 
um, role variables, so uh, factors that contribute to their identification with the the role that they play within the organization. And then also organizational justice have been defined as possibly contributing to job satisfaction. The overall pattern that researchers have been offering is that um, with regard to social factors, when there is ambiguity, there is gonna be lower job satisfaction. When a person really doesn't know what their role is, if they aren't sure where they stand in their relationships within the organization, um, if they're not sure whether this is an, a, a just organization or not. Um, when Whenever a person is feeling um, unsure, it's probably going to lower their job satisfaction. And then growth opportunities is the last category of antecedents that have been examined. And um, here we're looking at things like the opportunity for promotion, the opportunity to earn more money through good performance in what we call merit pay, um, access to benefits, the ability to have a work-life balance that the employee is satisfied with. Um, so we call those growth opportunities. Um, now, when we talk about job satisfaction, it's usually measured by things like statements like this one. In general, I like my job. I mean, it's pretty face valid. It's really clear what they're being asked. Um, there's also, also the ability to measure job satisfaction through um, asking how satisfied they are with their pay. A lot of times people will be satisfied with lower pay when they are more satisfied with the job itself. Um, if they're satisfied with their supervisor, that can be a reflection of overall how satisfied they are with their job. Because, you know, you can tolerate a, a, a poorer um, supervisor when in general you're satisfied with the job, things like that. So we see lots of factors that have been offered as possible antecedents to job satisfaction. But what you'll notice is I only had a few places where I could give you actual concrete correlation coefficients, which implies that there's a lot of work left to be done on these on this subject, right? There are a lot of things that have been offered as possible contributors to job satisfaction and relatively few that have actually been quantitatively studied. So let's look at the measurement and the dimensions of job satisfaction. So there's the job descriptive index, which um, is the most frequently used measure and is has been the best validated. So what it, hopefully you guys recall that means is that they have done lots of um, quantitative research on the actual measure um, and have come to the conclusion that it really is measuring what it's claiming to measure. Um, so this particular measure has five dimensions of satisfaction. And so those five dimensions are satisfaction with type of work, satisfaction with pay, satisfaction with promotion opportunities, um, satisfaction with their supervision and satisfaction with their coworkers, and then so you get these five different dimensions so you could have individual scores for each scale and a person could be high on one scale, scale like maybe they're happy with the pay but they are unhappy they are less satisfied with their supervision or something like that right so you can imagine that these scales are, are relatively independent of each other and factor analysis has revealed that they are in fact independent scales um, but then you can sum them all together and get an overall satisfaction measure for the person's overall satisfaction with their with their work. There's the job diagnostic survey, which measures satisfaction as a function of, you're going to see a lot of overlap here, right? We got pay, um, security, social factors, which might sound a lot like coworkers. Um, and then we've got supervision, growth. And then again, you can get one overall sum and call that overall satisfaction. So you've got these, in this case, four individual um, subscales and then the overall satisfaction. So one big difference between the two is uh, the job diagnostic survey does not have the type of work as a separate subscale. Um, and then we've got the addition, well, Promotion opportunities and growth are probably pretty similar. Supervision is obviously the same thing. We've got social factors, which I think could be very similar to coworkers. We've got the addition of security on this list. So we've got, uh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five. I said four earlier. Apparently I can't count. Um, five scales. We've dropped type of work and added security in the job diagnostic survey. In the Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire, it's based on a theory of work adjustment. And so it is a survey that was designed to measure aspects of that theory. So there's 100 items and 20 facets. 
So there is a short form that's available that only has 20 items. Um, and the, it's not intending necessarily to produce 20 individual subscores. What it's trying to do is um, tap into the different facets that are offered by adjust, uh, work adjustment theory and then provide an overall satisfaction measure um, across all of these different facets. 100 items is pretty long, and so it reduces the um, utility of the scale. The faces scale, and I just gave you two faces as an example of what you would actually see on this survey. So you can see that the face on the left is a little less dissatisfied than the face on the right. And there's a whole series of them. I think it's a it's 10 and they have like more and more dissatisfied faces going from um, happy to unhappy. So it's going to measure the affective, the emotional component of job satisfaction and then assess overall satisfaction. It's flexible across lots of situations because it doesn't require any kind of reading. Um, it's nonverbal, and so it can be used across lots of different jobs and lots of different kinds of employees. Maybe ones who don't speak English could still take this scale. Um, and then it could be adapted for measuring different kinds of affects. So the picture I've shown you is like sort of a happy, unhappy affect, but um, we can, you know, you could have different facial expressions for different kinds of different aspects of satisfaction. You could have um, these faces associated with how do you feel about pay? How do you feel about supervision, right? So you could imagine prompting the response with different kinds of um, cues. So it's pretty flexible, but it's also kind of limited because I'm answering with, you know, these faces. And a lot of times people have difficulty picking between, you know, two adjacent faces. They're like, well, I'm not sure which one I would pick. Whereas if it had been listed as numbers and you were supposed to pick something from one out of 10, a lot of times people don't feel the same kind of difficulty picking a six versus a seven that they might have picking this slightly neutral face versus this slightly more negative face, right? Like that can be tricky. Um, so the face to scale is used in certain circumstances and probably the job descriptive index would be used in most circumstances. Okay, so those are ways that we can measure job satisfaction. Um, let's talk about, we've measured job satisfaction. So we talked about the antecedents on you know previously then we just talked about how we would measure job satisfaction now let's talk about what some of the consequences of job satisfaction might be um, one big consequence is on performance right um, you know how well is the person actually performing at work and so we've got the task performance issue and then we've got the contextual issue and again remember all correlations are going to be between whatever the factor is and then job satisfaction so the correlation between task performance and job satisfaction ranges depending on the study um, we see higher correlations between task performance and job satisfaction in individualistic societies than we do in collectivistic societies so that kind of implies that there's um, you know something going on that has to do with um, you know individual identity or something like that that um, is probably moderating task performance and its relationship with job satisfaction. And that might help to explain why it could be as low as 0.3 and as high as 0.59 across the different studies. Um, withdrawal behaviors could be another consequence of job satisfaction. I put it in pink to indicate that this is a negative outcome uh, because when we have a person who's experiencing lower levels of job satisfaction, we may see higher levels of withdrawal behaviors that include things like absenteeism, lateness, and turnover, you know, right, actually leaving the job. Um, so there have been mixed findings on absenteeism, and I'll explain why in a second on that one. Uh, oh, Okay, well, apparently I'm explaining it right now. I thought I was going to tell you the rest of that list, but apparently we're going right to why we might have mixed results on the uh, absenteeism. Um, so there's this attendance model that was uh, provided by Steers and Rhodes back in 1978. And um, they had initially said job satisfaction will directly lead to attendance motivation and that motivation will ultimately lead to employee, employee in attendance. Um, so that's kind of ignoring some factors that may actually 
modify whether the person attends or not, right? So um, attendance motivation might not just be a function of job satisfaction. It might also be a function of pressure to attend. Um, Maybe I have to go to work because I know that if I'm not a good, reliable employee, the market conditions are such that they'll just let me go and hire somebody else. Like I have to keep coming. Um, I can't I can't, um, you know, show these kinds of withdrawal behaviors because I don't have another job to go to. And in this economic situation, I have no options, right? So that's going to be one of those pressures to attend. Um, There might be pressures to attend based on incentive or reward systems. Um, So if I uh, go an entire month without a an absence, maybe I get some kind of benefit. When my husband was a baggage handler for Southwest Airlines, if they went 30 days without an absence, then they earned uh, one, I can't remember what they used to call it, but once you accumulated enough of whatever it was that it was called, and I think it was six months, maybe it was three months. So if you went a solid month without an absence, you got this, I'll just call it a token because a psychologist call it a token when we when we give you something that isn't really worth anything but if you accumulate enough of them then it's worth something so if you went a month you got this token if you went three months and accumulated three tokens like they didn't have to be consecutive months right you just had to accumulate three tokens all together and then you could turn them in for what was called a buddy pass they probably still have them and that was a um voucher that would allow a friend or a family member who's not normally qualified to fly for free on Southwest under your employment status to be able to fly for free. And so if you could get three, you know, months of attendance, you had this incentive because you could then, you know, travel with your brother or, you know, fly your mom out or something like that, that otherwise wouldn't have been eligible for your free flight benefits. So that would encourage people to not miss. And especially, you know, if you're at day 28 of perfect attendance and you're starting to feel like you're coming down with something, it could motivate you to want to come to work even so. And as I'm recording this lecture in the middle of, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, we could see the implications of that kind of incentive or reward system, right? That we might have a person who's like, all I got to do is get two more days and I've, I've earned my token, right? Um, so, and especially if you can imagine that if it's day 28 of your third month of perfect attendance and you're about to get the actual reward, um, you can imagine that these incentives could cause people to attend even when it might not be in their best interest or in their coworkers best interest. Work group norms, right? If everybody else is attending who works in your work group, you could imagine that that would feel like a little bit of a pressure not to let the rest of the group down, right? Like if you miss work, everybody else's work is going to be affected by it and you don't want to let everybody else down. And so that could be one of those pressures to attend. I would like to point out it could also be a pressure to not attend, by the way, right? Uh, (laughs) If the rest of the group is being flaky, you might not want to be the sucker who shows up and has to pick up all the extra work, right? There's also the personal work ethics. And, you know, some of us have an ethical um, mindset that it is our responsibility to attend, um, that it would be wrong to not come to work just because we're tired because we stayed out too late last night or something like that. And other people don't have that same work ethic. And so pressure to attend could come from inside of yourself. Um, now, there are some factors that moderate the relationship between attendance motivation and then actual attendance. And that would be labeled the group that is the ability to attend. So um, if you are in fact sick, you're experiencing some kind of illness, that even though you might be satisfied with your job, you might be motivated to attend your job either through outside pressures or your own internal status, whatever. But if you are in fact ill, that may interfere and cause you to actually not come to work. And I would just like to argue that should interfere with one coming to work, right? Um, Family responsibilities could be a moderating factor also, right? So no matter what your attendance motivation is, knowing that your... um, your family, you're like, you're the only one with a car and somebody needs to get to the, to their doctor's appointment or something. Your your family needs you. And if your family responsibilities outweigh the, the, the otherwise pressures to attend, um, you may go ahead and attend to your family responsibilities and that's going to affect your attendance, right? So there are factors that might intervene, um, that would make it less likely that you would actually attend because you're in your, um, 
inability to attend because of these other factors. Then there's always transportation problems. Um, I'm sure all of us have experienced oper- you know, situations where we needed to get somewhere and we couldn't because of our transportation problems. Um, you know, you might have your own car, but it won't start. Or I had my own car, but I went out one morning and the tire was completely flat. And so um, it wasn't even like I could drive it to the gas station or something. And, you know, I'm dressed for work and I discover this. I'm not going to change a tire. I'm like, this is horrible. I don't know what to do. Um, So, you know, that kind of, even if you have your own vehicle, you oftentimes have transportation problems. Not to mention that, um, you know, if you don't have your own vehicle and you're relying on public transportation, there's a whole host of things that go along with that that might interfere with your ability to attend. Um, And, you know, a lot of times these things happen, you know, you could argue through some fault of your own if you got to the bus stop two minutes late and missed the bus, that's technically your fault, right? And now you're half an hour late to work. Um, that's not technically your fault. I mean, that, that's your fault. You know when the bus leaves, right? Um, if I had checked my car the night before, I would have known that the tire was going flat. I mean, you know, one could argue that transportation problems are somewhat in the in the hands of the employee, but also sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes uh, I had a student who was uh, on the bus heading over to class one night and uh, there was a car accident involving a pedestrian. And so everything was shut while they were trying to airlift this pedestrian out. And my student was just stuck on the bus <laughs> waiting. Wait, you know, that that's, was not in the, the student got on the bus on time. The bus was doing its thing it was supposed to be doing, but unforeseen things happen sometimes. And so the employee might have all the motivation in the world, be as satisfied as they can be with their job and they want to be there, um, but things can actually interfere and make it, uh, you know, them unable to attend work. So we can't always just look at employee attendance as evidence that the employee's not that into the job. We just have to take these other things. We can't um, look at their attendance and say they're here, they must like it either, right? There might be these external pressures to attend. So we have to be really careful about inferring job satisfaction from employee attendance. So let's finish up this little consequences thing. So I had mentioned that one consequence of job satisfaction could be withdrawal behaviors. So we mentioned absenteeism. What about lateness and turnover? Um, So there's a negative correlation between job satisfaction and lateness. So people who are more satisfied with their job are less likely to be late to work. Um, And then with turnover, it's between a 0.2 and a 0.3. And this is also negatively correlated. So we have, you know, the people who are more satisfied with their job being less likely to leave their job. Now these correlation coefficients are smaller than than some of the correlation coefficients I've been reporting. So these are not, um, we can't say that, you know, there's a really powerful correlation between lateness and turnover um, and job satisfaction, but we can say they are correlated. Um, we can't say that they're causally related, right? Because they're correlations, but we can say that these things do seem to be going together and we might want to try and figure out some way to determine, you know, why they're going together. Why, why is there a negative correlation between job satisfaction and lateness? You know, what factors are contributing to that? Now, with regard to turnover, I wanted to mention that there are things that actually could modify the turnover correlation, right? That you could have a person who's highly unsatisfied with their job, but they're not leaving it necessarily. And it could be because they are perceiving it to be too difficult to move right? Like, where would I go? Where is there a job sort of like this in my community that I could easily move? Are they hiring? Um, And then the perceived desirability of movement. There are a lot of reasons why a person might think it would be undesirable to change jobs, even if they are unsatisfied with the job they have right now. Um, It might be that the alternative place of employment is too far away from where they live. It could be that the, the alternative place of employment doesn't pay as much as the current one does. It could be that you know, one of them is unionized and the other one's not. It could be, you know, a whole host of factors that could make it so that even if I felt like there was a place I could go that I really don't want to, like, it's better to stay where I am. Unha- like my, uh, my husband, when he was in the military was sent to another station and his friends were like, well, how do you like the new station? And he had this phrase that I had never heard before, but he said, same game, different table. And, uh, like a sort of gambling reference, right. That, it, it, you know, the, the players are different. You know, like if I were to move to another job, it still would be the same basic job. Right. And so maybe I realize I'm, I'm, I'll give you another idiom. 
why jump out of the frying pan and into the fire? Like, I already know where I am here. And I know the constructs. I know the the constraints. I know all the things. And so why would I leave? I at least understand this place. I know the people here and, and like that. And so you could imagine that even if you felt like there was a, another place to go to, it might not seem that desirable. Might as well stay where you are. So um, we have another model, a couple of models for you uh, that might explain withdrawal behaviors. Haman Griffith argued that job satisfaction leads to thoughts of quitting or not. And then, you know, if it's leading to thoughts of quitting, it, those thoughts are what ultimately contribute to quitting. But they um, had to expand this out with a little bit more nuance after doing some research. And they realized that there are some moderating factors that contribute to um, actual quitting. So we've got job satisfaction still on the far left. And then in the middle, they've actually spread it out a little bit and said, well, okay, so what is my attitude about quitting? Like some people have attitudes like, you know, they somehow owe their employer something and so it would be wrong to quit. I actually know somebody who, who after a year of working at the first place that she got employed after um, getting her degree, um, she, didn't, she didn't like the commute. She didn't like the neighborhood. She didn't like what she was doing. And so I said, well, why don't you look around? She was in a field that was highly desirable. There were lots of places way closer to her home where she could work and um, things. I'm like, why don't you change jobs? And she said, well, they were the first ones to hire me out of college. I mean, don't I owe them a couple of years? I'm like, no. (laughs) So apparently my attitude about quitting and her attitude about quitting are highly different. Um, ironically, three years later, she's still at that same job. So I'm going to have to say that possibly there were other factors that were um, at play with her job satisfaction and willingness to quit. But um, if you don't, if you have an attitude where you feel like you have to stay, um, that's obviously going to moderate how, you know, how likely you are to quit, right? Um, Engaging in a job search is going to be dependent on your attitudes about quitting. So once you actually start getting serious and thinking, okay, I I really have got to leave this job, usually the next step is, where can I go, right? And then you start comparing alternatives and you start thinking about all those things I was saying on the last slide about, you know, would it be worthwhile? Um, Is, am I going to take a pay deduction or am I just lateraling over or is the commute going to be prohibitive? You know, you start thinking all those thoughts and start comparing the alternatives. And if the um, movement compares favorably, then it makes it more likely that you'll actually quit. Now, the unfolding model offered by Lee and his colleagues um, said that when there's a shock to the system, it could be an unsolicited job offer, right? You're sitting there fat, dumb, and happy in your little job doing your thing, and somebody from another organization approaches you and says, have you ever thought of applying to work for us, right? An unsolicited job offer. A change in marital status, getting married, getting divorced, something like that. Um, being transferred, a lot of times you get a transfer through your own um, employer or you're told you need to transfer and now you have to decide, do I really want to transfer? Do I want to stay where I am? Um, or maybe uh, your spouse or, or significant other is getting a transfer and so you have to decide whether you want to stay behind with the job that you have or do I want to transfer? Um, maybe there's been a merger and um, you're not sure what that means for your job position or something like that. These are just examples of the kinds of things that that Lee and colleagues meant by shock to the system. Like suddenly I'm looking at the world differently is what what this basically means. And um, so that kind of shock is what they conceive as the most important factor in propelling turnover. And actually um, research has shown that half of voluntary turnover is due to either family reasons or an unsolicited job offer. So, you know, the, that change in marital status or your spouse being transferred um, would be under that category of family reasons or an unsolicited job offer. A lot of times people are happy in the job that they're in until they find out that they're desirable to someplace else and maybe they've been offered something better. My dad got headhunted when he was working for um, Miller Brewery and um, Coors gave him an unsolicited job offer and he hadn't thought about leaving Miller. He was happy. He was, you know, doing his thing. But then suddenly here comes Coors and he's like, hmm, hmm. And he, he actually went for it. He, um, he had a lot of family responsibilities and things that should have made him maybe not want to change, but he ultimately took the opportunity to quit and actually get a, um, you know, improved status and stuff like that, right? I sh- it took a shock to the system, though. I don't think I think he would have retired out of Miller's if if um, Coors hadn't approached him. So, right there's 
like that kind of shock can oftentimes cause a person who's otherwise satisfied um, to actually leave. All right, so those are our withdrawal behaviors. Counterproductive behaviors are also negative things. Um, CD, CWBs are what they oftentimes refer to them, and that stands for um, counterproductive work behaviors. Um, and those would be any behaviors that bring or intend to bring harm to an organization, its employees, or its stakeholders. So those little destructive things, um, you know, deliberately done, the thing is it's intended to bring harm to the organization. Like you're, you're wanting the organization or its employees or its stakeholders to be harmed. So this would include things like theft of company property, sabotage, and that could take the form of actually harming the equipment that's used to produce, you know, the, the widgets that you're building, or it could be sabotage by, you know, leaking information to the press or other kinds of things, um, behaving aggressively on the job or toward the job. Um, all of those are examples of counterproductive behaviors. And across the three of them, you know, different studies have looked at different combinations of these kinds of counterproductive behaviors. Some studies look at all of them together. Some look at just subsets. The thing is, what you find is that the correlation between job satisfaction and any of these counterproductive behaviors is not very strong. It really isn't. It doesn't turn out that necessarily dissatisfied employees are the ones who are behaving in counterproductive ways. Sometimes you have very satisfied employees, but they're unhappy with some aspect of how, um, the uh, management is handling something and so they're doing some kind of retaliatory like counterproductive behaviors hoping that the um, that the people in charge will change their ways right like they want to stay at the at the place of employment they just want it to change in, in the way that they want it to change and so they'll they'll sometimes be satisfied employees except for this one little this one little part so that might be one of the reasons why the counterproductive behaviors is not very strongly correlated. You'll notice it is negatively correlated. So the more satisfied a person is, the less likely they are to engage in these kinds of behaviors. Um, so you can imagine that for an organization, it'd be in their best interest to try and ensure that their employees are not feeling these kinds of feelings that would make them want to behave counterproductively. That's for sure. So we could argue that, you know, all of these consequences are um, important consequences for an organization that wants to maintain a stable and productive workforce, right? A happy workforce, a workforce that wants to contribute. Um, so we want to increase, um, you know, the performance qu consequences. We want, you know, good task performance. We want good contextual performance. And we want to reduce the withdrawal behaviors and the counterproductive behaviors. So um, I don't think we can always change those things, though, with job satisfaction. That's the important thing to note, that there are these intervening things that contribute to the withdrawal behaviors and the counterproductive behaviors. All right. I'm going to stop here. We will come back and, and complete this chapter with a discussion of organizational commitment.